Welcome to the City Talks. I'm Jordan St. Ross. I'm a professor of history uh, at the University of Victoria. And about 10 years ago, uh, a number of us at the university started having conversations, I think it was 2009, I guess that's more than 10 years ago, uh, about getting together around issues that might be of concern to people in the city of Victoria. Uh, we envisioned a mixed audience of maybe local activists, people involved in politics, students, uh, scholars, and uh, we started inviting people. Our first uh, event here, I think it was still a cafe here, and Leonie Sandercock, a planner at uh, UBC, came and gave a talk and presented a film on colonialism and cities in BC. And there were people packed in the rafters. It was a wild scene. We didn't know what to expect. Uh, so it's really fun to be back in person again. It's good that we're not packed in in that way, that we have nice space from one another this evening. But thanks to all of you for coming out and for uh, giving a shot at a lot, our, our first live event in over a year. Um, I want to offer a territorial acknowledgement of the University of Victoria to acknowledge uh, and respect the Lagwangan people on whose traditional territory the university stands, and, and so does this building and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich people whose historic relations to the land continue to this day. Um, yeah, this, this set of talks this fall emerged actually from a conversation that I had, an encounter I had with uh, an inner city nurse working here in Victoria who came con concerned about um, about what was going to happen to the, the temporary housing for folks where she was working as a nurse uh, along the gorge. And uh, she just saw this kind of looming end of the pandemic and looming end of the housing situation uh, that had been temporarily arranged there and was just very concerned. She wanted my advice because I've written a few uh, op-eds. She wanted my advice about writing an op-ed. And I sort of, sort of said, well, you know, uh, it depends what you hope to achieve through an op-ed. And conversations continued and we landed on this. Uh, and Anna would be here today, except that uh, uh, she's not able to, with the work she's doing, gather into, uh, into large, uh, uh, well, into gatherings like this uh, in any event. And so, uh, but uh, Anna uh, Trowbridge uh, really inspired this series to ask uh, in a series of talks, both through some historical perspectives, but especially today with a contemporary political lens, uh, what's Victoria going to look like post-pandemic? How can we ensure that we don't and that we we don't end up with a situation that problems that we had pre-pandemic are exacerbated? How might we instead emerge as a more uh, just city uh, after the pandemic? And that was the question that we asked the two speakers uh, today. The the whole uh, uh, theme of the series is emergence. Victoria surfaces from the pandemic. And admittedly, when we thought of that theme, we thought we might be more surfaced um, than uh, we are. Uh, but we're still looking uh, forward in that way. What will it mean as we emerge eventually from this pandemic? And today, specifically, the topic that we asked our uh, speakers to talk about is surfacing towards justice. Can Victoria be a better city after COVID? Uh, we had three speakers lined up, uh, but one, a really wonderful speaker, uh, Fran Hunt Genucci, had an exposure to COVID and, and so wasn't able to join us today. But if you, if you look online after, uh, once we get this uh, talk uh, online, uh, through our website, thecitytalks.ca, we'll include Fran's talk there as well. She's going to do a video uh, presentation. And she's really fantastic. I really urge that you uh, check that out. I'll just introduce her because she'll be part of that in any event. So Fran Hunt Genucci is the, is, is the uh, uh, Director of Housing Development Research at the Aboriginal Coalition to End uh, Homelessness. She has more than 20 years experience in senior management and direct engagement with Indigenous people in roles that have included Executive Director of the Aboriginal Coalition to End Homelessness and as the inaugural director of the Office of Indigenous Affairs at the University of Victoria. She's a really powerful speaker and will have a lot to say, I think, about those questions that Anna raised with me about homelessness and what post-COVID will look like. Lisa Helps, some of you will know, is the 52nd mayor of Victoria, first elected to office in 2014, and then for a second term in 2018. 
Before that, she was a city councillor from 2011. Before that, I knew her as a really outstanding and promising young history student. Uh, and uh, she was at that time um, working on questions of inequality and homelessness and uh, authority in British Columbia, doing really interesting work. And I know that those passions have carried over into her public service as well. She's most famous or uh, most remembered in our household for, by my oldest daughter, uh, not the one who's here tonight, for having given her back. I don't know if you remember that, Lisa, but, but you know, Eva and, and my wife are really proud, you know, Lisa helps give Eva back. So that's, <laughs> I don't know if you're often introduced in that fashion. No, the first time. <laughs> And Jean McCrae is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Intercultural Association of Victoria, uh, known, which is known uh, by many of us for its role in supporting private, private sponsorship of refugees and supporting immigrants more generally in Victoria. She's been working in immigrant and refugee uh, services, I think she was trying to remember while we were uh, talking before, since 1982, I think is uh, what the bio says. Uh, and she's held a variety of national uh, leadership roles, and I met her on perhaps the final grant adjudication committee of the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada to meet in person in March of 2020, uh, and, uh, and, and we were there wondering what was going to happen with this COVID thing. And Jean, it's really wonderful to do my first in-person event uh, with you uh, uh, now that we're able to do that. So uh, I'll welcome in that order. Uh, Lisa and, and Jean to speak for about 15 minutes each, although you have a little bit of latitude with, with the fact that we're down a speaker, and then we'll invite some Q&A uh, with the audience. So welcome again. Great. Thanks very much, Jordan. Um, thanks for having me, and to all of you, thanks for coming. Um, it's it, The last time I was in this uh, gallery, I think it was for an event on graffiti. I don't know if it was a city talk or not, but it's the same. It was packed, and uh, but this is nice and intimate, and um, really appreciate everyone coming. Uh, and it is really too bad that Fran's not here because she is an amazing, dynamic human being, uh, and it will be great for all of us to listen to what she has to say. Um, before I get into some of the things that I want to say tonight, I also want to acknowledge um, the lands that we're on, um, the lands of the Lekwungen people, the Songhees, and the Esquimalt nations. And also recognize uh, that tomorrow, and some of you are already donning your orange shirts and maybe have been wearing them uh, all week, uh, is, is going to be a really um, painful time for the people of these lands. Um, as we remember and gather uh, their, their children, the ones who didn't come home, and also the ones who did. So just, it's a bit, um, uh, it's, yeah, I don't exactly know how to do a territorial acknowledgement uh, on, on the eve of uh, such an important um, day, the first national day for truth and reconciliation. So just wanted to begin with that. And, and actually where I've just come from before now is City Hall because everything is on Zoom, but uh, at City Hall I was on a Zoom meeting with the uh, Esquimalt Chief and Council and uh, just you know checking in with them to see how they're doing and um, really just want to ground us all today in, in what's coming tomorrow. Uh, so I don't know, um, maybe Jordan, give me a wave when it's time to stop talking. I just, I put together a bunch of thoughts and ideas and uh, of course really want to hear what, uh, what Jean has to say and then hopefully because it's a small group this evening we could have maybe less of a Q&A and more of a, a dialogue uh, on surfacing towards justice. Can Victoria be a better city after COVID-19? And of course the answer is yes, Victoria can be a better city after COVID-19. Um, so I think then what we need to ask is how. How can Victoria be a better city after COVID-19? Um, and what does a post-COVID world look like here in Victoria? Uh, is it more or less inclusive? Is it more or less resilient? Is it more individual or is it more collective? And is it more ready for the future? So. In the middle of COVID, um, even before COVID hit, we were uh, starting to develop a uh, economic action plan for this term of council. And then COVID hit and just like everything else, we had to pivot and create um, a different kind of action plan. I don't even remember what the title of the original one was to tell you the truth. Um, but what we landed on uh, is Victoria 3.0, recovery, reinvention and resilience. And it's here, I brought it, because I carry it just about everywhere. 
Um, and it's those three themes that I want to talk about tonight, recovery, reinvention, and resilience. And the thrust of this plan, um, even though it's technically an economic action plan, is to really create a community that is based in low carbon prosperity and an inclusive economy. And those are really important kind of dual focuses for the city and the community coming out of COVID. So recovery, reinvention, and resilience. Um, recovery is actually the easy bit, believe it or not. Um, recovery it will just in some ways uh, allow us to do what we were already doing before. Uh, and, and that's important. And in some ways, there's, there's a basis for that. And I'll, I'll just give some examples about how and why. Um, reinvention is really difficult. It is really difficult um, in a community. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the city's welcoming city strategy, <clears throat> which will be coming to council very soon. And we just got the final draft of it. And we did some engagement. Basically, a welcoming city is strategy is to make Victoria uh, more welcoming and less racist, essentially. It, the less racist part, you're not really supposed to say out loud, but I think it's important that it's not just about becoming uh, more welcoming, because that's just the feel-good part, but we're, you know, to actively become an anti-racist city. And I don't mean not supposed to say out loud, but all the welcoming city lingo doesn't use that, so we've been kind of deliberately using it. Anyways, we're doing engagement, uh, and we got some really interesting feedback, and one of the comments that stuck with me uh, about why reinvention is so difficult um, and this is what some, one of the people who is involved in the um, engagement said, that Victoria is a community with a polite lack of curiosity, which I find really, really interesting. And so how do we reinvent ourselves as a city and a community if we're not even curious, if we're politely uncurious? Um, and so reinvention is, is a bigger challenge than recovery. And then resilience, of course, is the most difficult of all. Um, because that means that we need to come together as a community and get ready for the next pandemic, for climate change, for an influx of refugees from Afghanistan, for whatever the world is going to bring us. And so resilience is the real challenge. And I think when we were writing this action plan, we didn't realize that it was kind of a, a ladder on this recovery, reinvention and resilience with the, the easiest part um, first. So I'll talk about the easiest part and then I want to spend a bit of time on um, reinvention and resilience. Um, it, it has been important throughout the pandemic to support um, our small businesses because they were really, really hard hit. Um, there was a lot of pivoting happening and some people pivoted uh, very quickly to Amazon. So much so, and I find this very distressing, that we're having an Amazon distribution center built out by the airport uh, so they can ship their goods up and down Vancouver Island even though we've got amazing local businesses. Uh, Roberta's Hats is one, and I know there's some Roberta's Hats employed here this evening. Uh, so we, we really did want to support our local businesses, and, and I think we've done a good job on that, and that's the recovery piece. Um, we're going to release some numbers uh, later this week um, that show, and I'll just sh read some of them because they're, they're easy. Um, this summer compared to last, 44% increase of people on Government Street, uh, pedestrians. Um, an increase in business licenses, an increase in hotel occupancy, uh, an increase in parking transactions, uh, an increase in um, building permit values. Uh, and so those are good things. Don't get me wrong, those economic indicators are all going in the right direction, uh, and, and that's really important. Um, and of course, a good economy is uh, a good basis for the other things that we need to do. But the recovery part is easy. Uh, the reinvention part is, is where it gets a little bit more difficult. And we need to reinvent ourselves, and I think we are reinventing ourselves, um, both at a systems level, and then also reinventing our vision of who is our community. Who is Victoria? Because it's not the same Victoria as it was 10 years ago even. And so just a couple of examples of the reinvention that's required at a systems level. Um, and Jordan touched on this a little bit in terms of the inspiration for the talk. Uh, if we're really going to get everybody who needs one, and that's everyone, into a home, we need to really think differently about how we're approaching homelessness. And that is a massive reinvention. Um, and and I'll, just, I'll tell you about my week uh, as, a, as an illustration. 
Um, on Sunday afternoon, around 2 o'clock, 2.30, I got word that our bylaw officers were in Topaz Park dismantling a uh, community care tent and some tents that people were setting up to provide people who are living outside with COVID um, and have no place to go. Uh, they were trying to set up supports for them. And in a province as prosperous as British Columbia, people who have COVID should not be living outside on the street at all. That is just, it's, it's completely unacceptable. And, and the people who are there were, were, were trying to do a good thing. The complication is that the city has signed a memorandum of understanding with the province to not allow encampments. And so our bylaw officers are in a really difficult situation. And so at 4.30 on Sunday afternoon, I called an emergency meeting with Island Health, BC Housing, the city and bylaw to figure out what are we gonna do with people who have COVID, they have no fixed address and they need a place to go. And you'd think that it would be easy. If our systems were functioning properly, this wouldn't even be a problem. But it is a problem, and it was a problem. You know, Island Health earlier in the pandemic had reserved hotel rooms. Well, they thought they didn't need them because as we were all saying, like, who knew what a fourth wave was going to look like? And, and in, in a series of the last few days, we've actually, and this is the reinvention part, with BC Housing, Island Health, and the city sitting down, you know, in these repeated emergency meetings, today's only Wednesday, and now there's a system in place. If someone's identified as COVID positive and have no fixed address, there's a morning meeting, their name is given to BC Housing, BC Housing finds them a place in an existing shelter where some COVID beds are set aside, set aside and so on and so forth. Anyways, it, it, the, the point is, it shouldn't take emergency meetings and being pushed to the brink. We should have the system in place where BC Housing, Island Health and the city are already and always knitted together. And so that's one of the key lessons from COVID. We know how to act in a crisis. We know how to fix emergencies, but the solutions that are coming forward need to become new ways of doing things, not just COVID solutions. So that's kind of just one example of a systems reinvention, and there are many, many more. The next um, piece of reinvention that's important if we're going to be able to become Victoria 3.0, the inclusive economy and the low carbon prosperity, is we need to reinvent our vision of who we are as a community. And that's one of the things that's really come to the fore during COVID uh, with the Black Lives Matter uh, rallies and events last summer, um, with the uncovering of the children's bodies in Kamloops and other places, and the backlash of racism against Indigenous people um, when things like Cancel Canada Day happened. Um, we need to ask ourselves, who is Victoria in the 21st and going into the 22nd century? And what do we do about this new Victoria? How do we love this new Victoria into being as a community? Um, just some, some data, because I think it's always important to ground some of these things in, in facts. Uh, between 2011 and 2016, so the last census period, 28% increase in people of visible minorities in Victoria, racialized people in Victoria, 28% increase. That's awesome. And this new census period, I have a gut feeling it's going to be even more. And why? Because Victoria tells a story of itself somehow, and I don't understand how. It's because we've got great ambassadors and people who are, are bringing their families here as a place where it's safe and welcoming to come if you're a racialized person. And that is a good story. That's a story that we want out there. But the reality is, and, and Jean's organization did some really interesting research and important research, is it doesn't always play out on the ground. That Victoria is still a very racist place. Victoria is not an inclusive place. And that is something that really, really is a key focus for the city and for myself on how we reinvent coming out of COVID. And just a couple of initiatives to share with you. How am I doing for time? What does your daughter's watch say? She says you're still good. Oh yeah, it says I'm still good. Okay, excellent. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the initiatives I've already talked about, and this is, it's been really transformative. It's, it's hard to, um, I mean, we've all been on Zoom, but it's, it's, it, it, sometimes on Zoom and Teams, the only thing you have to connect with is your eyes and your face. And so sometimes it's like even more connecting than if you're in a room around a board table together. Anyways, 
Uh, last November, uh, out of direction from Council, the City created a welcoming city task force to look at ways that City Hall and our partners could make the city uh, more welcoming. And it's based on an international standard called the Welcoming City Standard, and there are seven kind of categories of, of, of action that, that need to be taken. And most of the committee uh, is made up of people um, from uh, ICA, uh, FERCs, uh, international students, young people, um, people who have experiences of being newcomers and being racialized in Victoria. And the, the strategy is coming to council, it's very concrete, you know, one year, two years, three, like all the actions that need to happen. And it's, it's a really good plan and I think council will adopt it and they will, um, we will implement it. And what's happened throughout the process is, and this is I think an important point to make about reinvention, um, the city needs to re reinvent itself, city hall needs to reinvent itself in terms of our approach to welcoming and inclusivity. But what we found, and it was really hard, well we just had our wrap up meeting uh, last night before the, the strategy goes to council, is that we've also reinvented ourselves individually. We've also, you know, the Carice, uh, who's a representative from Here Magazine, she said when she moved to her street, no one came out and said hello and welcome. Not one person. And so she's now taken it upon herself anytime anyone new moves to her street, particularly if there's somebody who's visibly a newcomer to Victoria, visibly from another country, she just rolls out the welcome wagon. And so she's a very shy person. And she's had to reinvent herself as we reinvent the city. So um, that is to say, and of course, there's systemic racism and systemic di discrimination, and it is not all on Carice or anyone else to do that work uh, on her on her own. But what is important is that we can't just leave reinvention to the strategies and the action plans. We need to find a way for everybody in the community to see themselves and see their role in what this new Victoria is. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Welcoming City Task Force and strategy, um, the city's hosting an amazing event, um, and maybe Jordan would be so kind to send out information on his mailing list if he has one. Uh, it's called um, Vital Conversations for Our Shared Future. Uh, and it's a three-day event, um, October 18th to 20th, where we're working with the Victoria Foundation and the Canadian Urban Institute. And the Welcoming Cities Task Force, they're the final plenary, so there are going to be task force members speaking to the community, uh, including anyone who wants to come, about what the process has meant for them, what they hope to see, and most importantly, in the spirit of systems reinvention, how they plan to hold us, City Hall, responsible and accountable for implementing the strategy. Um, I will move on to resilience. And resilience, as I said, is the most difficult of all because we can recover and that's easy. We can reinvent and that's difficult. And I, I had three more examples that I wanted to talk about reinvention, um, but I will save those for maybe the discussion. Uh, but resilience is really difficult because what that means is that we need to be able as a community to make it through. And not just to make it through, but no matter what comes our way, to be able to be flexible enough and fluid enough to be okay. And by that, and this is I think sometimes missed when we talk about resilience, by that I mean for everybody to be okay. Um, and so there's a number of things that the city is working on and thinking through, and of course climate resilience is really, really important. Um, with an equity and social justice lens. And the heat dome was awful and the forest fires were awful, but they're really awful if you're living on the street. They're really awful if you're a low-income senior who does not have the wherewithal to go somewhere cool. They're really awful if you're an Indigenous family living on reserve with eight people in a moldy home. And so part of climate resilience and getting ready for the future we know is coming is about making sure that everybody is okay and climate is approached through an equity lens. And that's something that, again, I could talk probably for 20 minutes or an hour on just that topic, but um, I'll leave that for now. But I think that climate resilience is important um, and, and social resilience is, is equally important. And by that I mean um, that on people's streets and in their neighborhoods and in their classrooms and in their workplaces, people have the relationships and the resources 
to support each other and make it through and reweave the social fabric that COVID has in some ways torn apart. And uh, I'm gonna wrap up very soon, um, but I just, it's this re reweaving the social fabric um, that I think we all need to, to think about um, for a couple of reasons. When COVID first hit, um, there was a sense that we were all in it together. That if you knew a senior who was alone, you brought them groceries. Uh, that there was like the, the Aboriginal Coalition the, and the Greater Victoria Coalition never saw so much money donated in the first three to four to five months of COVID. There was this outpouring of generosity, a spirit that we're all in this together, a spirit that we're going to make it through the you know, 7 p.m. banging pots for, for healthcare workers and others. And now look at us. Now look at us. People protesting outside of hospitals, uh, you know, neighbors turned against neighbors, uh, and you know, I, I don't mean to paint too dire a picture, but if this period of COVID is a dress rehearsal for the future challenges that are facing us, uh, we're, we're not doing that well. And so, you know, the, the, the call to action, I guess, and, and again, there are just so many, for those of you who are interested, there are so many ways that you can tap into all of the things that are happening in the community and, and, and you know, some of which are being led by the city. But the call to action is every day in everything we do, um, the recovery is easy, it's gonna be okay, but we need to think about how we can participate in the reinvention and participate in the creating of resilience um, so that we can collectively and individually uh, stitch ourselves back together so that Victoria can be and can emerge from the pandemic uh, as a more just um, place. So I will leave it there and uh, really look forward to hearing your thoughts. And there's a lot that I didn't get to say on all these papers that I brought, so um, maybe there'll be some questions and, and time for comment. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. I always like to follow Lisa. She's such a good speaker. <laughs> and, but I, I, um, I want to just start by also reflecting on this evening in particular. Um, I see it as an interesting position as an organization. This is our 50th year of, work, of uh, existing in Victoria. And since we started, we have always worked to have a, you know, strong relationships with Indigenous partners throughout the, air, throughout the area that we serve. But about five years ago, we said we need to redouble our efforts in this area. And so we started on what we've called our Indigenous Journey uh, Project. And we've learned a lot in that time. And I would say we are in a funny position because we have said about ourselves for years that we are building a welcoming and inclusive community. We are welcoming newcomers into the community, which is what we do. One of the things we learned through this process that we've been in in recent years is that it's not really our job to welcome people and that we've taken that to heart, and our staff have really um, gone deep into learning as much as they can. We've revised all of our curriculums. There were recommendations for immigrant services organizations in the Truth and Reconciliation recommendations, a few key ones, but we've really looked into them and tried to work on them. So that is sort of just the beginning of what we hope is our commitment to uh, this process of reconciliation and recognition, first of all, of the truth of, what, uh, of who we are and how we got to be where we are. So with that, I'll carry on a little bit. I, I, I want to say, I just want to pick up on a few things that you said. I, I've got a script, but I'm always better off script than I am on script. One of the things I've been working with refugees since I started as a high school teacher in Duncan in uh, 1982. And um, one of the things that has kept me going in this work is that immigrants, and in particular refugees, are highly resilient people. These are people who have had the worst happen to them. Um, speak of refugees in particular, they've been through terrible traumas. They've lost, you know, close family members, many have had many indignities forced upon them, and yet they come out the other side and they establish a life. And that is an inspiring thing over and over and over again. They are not all cut from the same cloth by any means, it's great diversity, 
great intelligence, great perspective, and that is who I've been able to work with, you know, for for all these years. So that that is something I think that I like to feel that I see is a little bit responsible for those changing demographics in our community. For immigrants, even though they choose to come to Canada, I don't think you would ever find an immigrant who said that that was an easy process and it all went smoothly. It just it doesn't. They have to get over a huge number of obstacles, um, you know, varied obstacles. I won't go into all of them, but I think you know that's part of that's who we're bringing into our community. And I'm going to go back a little bit in history around Victoria. One of the reasons that we've been so white compared to other cities of a similar size and nature across this country is that we had very few refugees coming in. When I first started working in Victoria, we did have refugees. We had refugees coming from primarily um, uh, Vietnam and, and Cambodia and those, that sort of part of the world. When, I, when Canada got very involved in sponsoring refugees for the first time where the program developed, and, and Victoria was a part of that. But then we stopped. We stopped bringing in government-assisted refugees. Everybody went through Vancouver. That wasn't our decision. That was a decision of, of the federal government. But everybody went through Vancouver. So as a consequence, no refugees came here to name other refugees under private sponsorship to come to, the, to come to this community and settle here with their family members who were already here. So we had a large gap in time when we were roughly for many years bringing in less than 20 refugees into this community a year. So in 2015 when you know we've obviously been involved in this area for a long time we were watching the growing uh, numbers of refugees internationally and the growing numbers of people who needed to be resettled we said let's get into the private sponsorship. So we applied and became a private sponsorship agreement holder and, and through that program we, since we started in 2015, uh, right before the Syrian refugees started to arrive, so we didn't start with a trickle. We started with a, you know, not a trickle. It was a, a you know a lot of work early on in our growth. But then we also became one of the first new rap centers to be the, the first new rap center outside of the traditional rap centers outside of Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Montreal. Um, to be named in 2016 to receive Syrian refugees. So since that started, we've probably um, brought well, it's over over 850 refugees have come into this community um, through ICA, and I'm very proud of that because I think that will make a very um, good contribution to building the new future for Victoria as we move, you know, out of hopefully soon out of COVID. There are some other things that I want to mention because I think they're important. I, the recovery is happening quickly. Prior to COVID, we were getting calls constantly from employers saying we're desperate for employees, we don't have enough, we really need people. And that slowed down through COVID and we're back at that again. We've got in, uh, employers calling us all the time. Their further recovery is very dependent on having the workforce to do that. And Victoria still has the issue of being demographically and you know on the aging side of the of the um, uh, spectrum I guess um, in, in terms of demographics so we really do need uh, new workers coming into into the community that's true across Canada but it's even more true here so um, that's something obviously that you know is important and immigration is important and I think you know even with the Election, of course, we always watch elections and worry about which way they'll go and how that will, the policies will affect us. But one of the things we weren't worried about is the commitment from the government of Canada, whatever strike, to continue with immigration because they understand that the, uh, well, where we'll get to if we don't actually recover well out of this and uh, keep moving forward and have the workforce to do, even though the, you know, the jobs may change, the workforce is, is still necessary. So um, I was thinking about you know, what happened during COVID and what lessons we've learned. There's a number of things that we saw early on, and you know, I totally agree. In the early days, we were just inundated with donations and offers of assistance. We quickly knew that we had clients who 
had low digital literacy, who didn't have access to connectivity, you know, just a digital connection, or to equipment, and we had a huge uh, generosity from our funders, from the Victoria Foundation, from the United Way, from just donors, um, so that we were able to buy equipment as rapidly as we could, so we were able to distribute what we could. We, you know, we triaged all our clients and said, which ones did we think were most likely to have to be struggling in this time, be it uh, for low income or for isolation or for lack of language or initially uh, very little of the information available to people was available in languages other than English and, and French and for some. But uh, we obviously needed more than that, so we worked hard on that sort of thing. Um, but there was this great outpouring of generosity, and we saw that before when we, when we welcomed the Syrian refugees. We saw a great outpouring of generosity, like overwhelming for us in many ways, just to keep up with all the offers of assistance and donations and other things that were going on. So we see that in surges, and it's one of the questions that always comes up for me is, like we know people, this is a, you know, this is a fairly wealthy community compared to many in this country and many around the world. So how do we keep up that level of generosity and support and caring for one another so that it doesn't just peak at one point and drop peak? What kind of crisis do we have to have in order to, to you know, get people to feel that way? So, you know, that, that, that's one of the questions that comes up for us. Um, but what I, what I would say is that it's, all, it's, it's wonderful to see how generous people have been. The other part of the pandemic, and you alluded to this, but that you've spoken about it, but you know, along with the pandemic comes Black Lives Matter, comes uh, a rise in anti-Asian um, racism, uh, comes, um, well, of course, the, the Discovery. I say that in quotes of the graves and, and the, you know, and increasing numbers of, of uh, graves being discovered around from the residential schools, and so a reckoning around that. Those are all you know, very difficult things, but I do think they did something very positive for our community. They opened up a conversation in a community that is, uh, we always think about it as being politely racist, you know. So it's not. You know, we know that exists. We see it in employment places, we see it in services, we see it inside families very often. You know, it's, it's in our community and it's so polite that it's hard to grab onto and figure out what to do. So, um, as negative as that is for people, I think it's an opportunity for us to be frank and open and really, um, you know, start thinking about this and I'm really, I've been really pleased to see the kind of response we've had in the community. We've, you know, we've been working to try and you know, have, build dialogue spaces and educational spaces and opportunities for people to address some of these issues, to ask questions, to build their skills, to, to understand how and learn how to be anti-racist, not just, you know, generally everything's okay, and you know, to really recognize what's going on and figure out what steps uh, we need to take in order to move forward. So we have had, um, through funding, through the, the um, City of Victoria's uh, participatory budgeting process, we've had funding to develop bystander training. To, to, it's to, it will be launching, I think, in two weeks. Um, we've been doing a lot of testing of the program, but you know, so training, and people have really embraced that. They want to know what they should be doing. And, and, I'll step back a little bit to say that one of the, the things that was revealed in the racism survey that uh, Lisa mentioned was, it's, it's, sort of said, it's like the tale of two cities. We have one part of the city that hardly sees any racism at all. They, they believe it exists, but they don't see it. And then we have another part of the city who not only sees it, but they feel it on a regular basis, sometimes a daily basis as they go about their regular lives. And so, you know, that to us signified a very clear um, problem that we needed to be able to try and devote some energy to. So the bystander training is one of the, the initiatives, and then the other is uh, one that we're, we're developing something called Tools for Equity that is also um, launching shortly. And that is more focused on organizations, businesses, employers, 
and we have had a huge interest in it. So it is sort of, we've been offering these kinds of trainings for years and years, and you know the, the, the interest in them flags up and down, and often people are, employers for example, or businesses are interested only if it's free and it doesn't take too long, and you know, so not, not much investment needed, thanks. But no, that's not what we're seeing now. People are much more engaged with that, and so I hope we can keep that momentum up. Um, as sort of part of the pieces that are important. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the other things that were revealed uh, during COVID that I, I hope that we're paying attention to. And I, you know, it's certainly not just the city who can, on their own, change these realities, but they are important ones for us to be paying attention to. One of them is the problem in nursing homes and long-term care settings. And we know that there have been outbreaks and early outbreaks and serious outbreaks in a lot of those, those uh, places uh, throughout the province, throughout the country, and, and locally too. And one of the main issues there as an immigrant serving organization looking at that is that many of the people working jobs in those centers are immigrants, are new immigrants, some of them are temporary foreign workers, and they are getting paid uh, part-time jobs in maybe three different places, two or three different places, in order to make enough money. And the employers are getting away with paying them part-time because it means they don't have to pay them the benefits they have to pay them if they're full-time. So it's like a structural problem that needs to be addressed if you're ever going to have a situation where you don't have people you know, migrating. It's not because they're trying to do anything wrong, they're doing everything they can and they're care about the people they're caring for, but they're just in this very precarious employment situation. And without you know, that being addressed, you know, the pay and the benefits and the stabilizing that system, it's always going to be uh, problematic. So that's one of the, the other one is just the heavy reliance on temporary residents. Um, as a community, it's not just Victoria, many communities are this way and increasingly this way. We depend very heavily on temporary workers to, to look after our food systems, you know, to pick vegetables or berries or whatever it is in our area. I was, um, I, you know, I wasn't aware for a while how many uh, temporary workers there were in the agriculture area in our way. And then, you know, we've been working on in a project and providing services over the last few years in collaboration with other organizations around BC. <laughs> And we've really seen a lot, you know, we understand much more how many people are in those kinds of jobs. Many of them were sent home, and so that means that local food hasn't been picked, which seems rather, uh, you know, it's like, it means we're importing stuff, probably through Amazon, I don't know. We have, <laughs> but we have, to, we have to pay attention to those things, our reliance on temporary residents. And then, of course, the other part of that reliance is we have a huge number of students, of international students who attend high schools and colleges and universities in our area, and they're a huge part of the economy. They, you know, they pay rent, they buy food and goods, they pay tuition, so they're they're um, a huge part of what we're. And so, you know, it's um, I, I'm not saying by any means it's a terrible thing. I wouldn't say that, but. I think we do need to be paying attention to it, and I think the other thing that's of key importance is that we are offering those uh, people a pathway to permanency. So many people are here on temporary visas, so the visa ends, maybe they can extend it a little bit, and then they have to go home. And I don't know whether that's the most sensible thing when we've, you know, we've got people coming through our education systems and maybe I think, no, I won't say maybe, my experience from not, I don't teach a lot, but I have taught at Royal Roads a few times, and uh, one of, you know, I, one of my classes, I think I, I polled the students at the beginning, one in 20 was intending to return to their home country, or, or didn't want to stay in Canada after their education. So, you know, there's a pool there of people that we need to be paying attention to. Um, and they're a big part of the vitality of the community that we live in. Um, obviously, income security is another one that was a, you know, a huge concern for people during this. That's not something that's going to be solved by the city, but it is an issue that you know, many people are far more precarious than we understand. I you know, spoke about one that you know, the, 
um, care system. But so that's one of the things. And then I think housing supply is the other thing. We do need people to work here. Employers, everybody says the same thing. Housing is hugely challenging, and I think we have to find a way. And I know I said to Lisa earlier, we all know that if this was an easy problem to solve, it would have been solved by now. But I think we need to start looking at it in different ways and really trying to move forward in ways that are um, more flexible, more open, uh, you know, building more possibilities for, for people to have a safe, comfortable um, home to live in. Otherwise, we won't be able to solve some of our problems. I'm going to bring in one more, and that has to do with uh, accessing health care. Um, we know uh, physicians have switched in many cases to doing you know, um, phone calls, consultations or face, uh, FaceTime consultations or whatever, something of that nature. And that's been really convenient for lots of people, and maybe that's freed up some of doctors' time, but we still have a situation with anybody coming into Victoria. We deal with immigrants, so we're constantly looking for doctors for people, family doctors, so that they can, their health care needs can be looked after. And of course, we can't find them, but we know that, you know that we're just one part of the population that's looking. There's a huge number of people in our area who can't find physicians. And at the same time, we have internationally trained medical doctors who are jumping through ridiculous hoops in order to be able to practice in this country. And that is a waste of their talent. And you know, as one uh, uh, friend of mine from Pakistan who is a doctor, she did not ever start you know, practice in Canada. But she said, you know, really, the human body's pretty much the same. It doesn't matter. So I think you know, those are sort of structural things that we need to, to work on. And it's very difficult for people to requalify. Expensive, time consuming, and many people give up. And then we've just you know, wasted all that talent when we really obviously need it. So um, I guess I, I won't go on for too much longer, but I just want to say uh, one of the intro, you know, in spite of anti-vax protesters in front of hospitals and in front of the ledge and all of that, I do think that it, we're also at an interesting place in, in, in that um, juncture between uh, being a collective society and being an individualistic society. And I certainly have heard a lot more people expressing the kind of sentiments and thoughts that say to me that maybe we're recognizing that we are actually all connected. Um, you know, in the work that we do, we know that we're connected to the world. You, know, you, don't, you can't pull on one thread and not have the other shift. So you know, we're connected to the world, but I also hear more talk about people uh, caring for one another and looking out for one another and trying to keep each other healthy. And I, um, I think there's an opportunity there and I agree. What, what is the way to grab that opportunity and to keep that conversation going? I don't know the answer to it. I hope that in our discussions maybe some of you have the answer to that. But I think it's, it's a really important, uh, important piece to think about. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much for both of those presentations. Tradition with larger crowds, I've stood up here and fielded questions, so I think out of habit I'll just do that anyway. Uh, so we need systems change. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it involves sitting, but I'll stand for now. We'll see. So, does anyone want to start us off with a question for either or both of uh, of the panelists? Yeah. Um, thank you, both of you. I had the pleasure of uh, meeting both of you. I'm Jessamine Dorchimanda. I'm an urban planner in the city, and right now I focus on anti-racism, and I have a project in the U.S. Minister, um, and I work with the city of the West as well. So for myself, when we want to create a just city or a just community, really what are the obstacles? So for myself, I enter a community, the first thing we should do is community needs assessment. And then we want to do a community engagement phase, and then we want to do a community mobilization. So when we enter communities or cities, I really feel the first thing we should do is check the pulse of what's going on, which means what are the gaps? 
what are the obstacles? So I'm gonna put this question for to both of you and anyone here. Because this work is not just professional for me, it's personal. I was uh, born and raised on the unceded lands of the Masonic peoples. So I faced racism on the elementary school grounds, faced racism during my master's program in urban planning at UBC, have faced racism as an urban planner in my own profession. So it's not just personal for us. Um, we live with it every day. So it has to be personal. But how do we carry ourselves professionally? And so my question is, what are the obstacles that are hindering and stopping us from really creating a just city and just communities? Do you want to start? Oh, yeah. Do I need to use the mic? Do I don't, I don't know. Do, is it does it benefit for you to use the mics? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah the second thumbs up for the back. Yeah. Better for the back. Okay. Not an easy question, is <laughs> I know you know. I I many times I think the biggest obstacle is fear. And, and I heard this reflected back in people's reaction sometimes when we talk about racism, for example, when we talk about equity and what that looks like. And I think, you know, I, when I first started in I, I, I see, I remember my boss saying to me at the time, you know, the smaller the pie, the more fierce the fighting. And I think that sometimes people really understand this kind of work is like, a sh the pie's only this big. And if I, you know, let something go, then I'm going to have less. And I don't. So I think one of the obstacles is around that is getting past that fear place. It, you know, this is not what it's about. It, the, the, the pie is not limited in size. It's, and and you know, yeah. And for some people, you know, giving up a little might not be that, as, you know, harmful as they think. Anyway, so I'll stop there. But I do think that fear is a huge piece. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I really wish that I had brought, uh, it, well it's not public yet, so I probably shouldn't have or couldn't have, but the, the Welcoming City strategy, we, we started, in, we, we, uh, we have consultants that helped us, but uh, with that exact question to people in the community, what makes Victoria unwelcoming? What are the obstacles to, to you feeling welcome here? And it was everything from um, when I go to a job interview, I can just tell that they're not looking for someone like me. Uh, so like, like kind of personal biases of the employer, uh, there's structural biases of not even getting an interview because of the, the way the name shows up on the resume. So there were a lot of economic systemic issues that were identified by the people of color uh, that were on the Welcoming City Task Force, but also who we did kind of a detailed public engagement. So wanted to make sure we reached out. So that was one. And then really, uh, you know, one that struck us, which I, we can address immediately, is um, uh, there, a black woman on our task force um, said, well, I feel unwelcome when I walk into City Hall because at the council chambers, there's this sea of white men, all the old mayors. And so that's easy. We just took them down. <laughs> like, you know, but so there's, there, there's, there, uh, uh, but I think that's, your, your question is a good, that's the first question that we should ask is what are the obstacles? Some are really easy to identify and remove and others are more systemic changes. And so uh, when the Welcoming City Strategy comes out and it will be published on, I think, Friday, October 15th, but if, if anyone who's interested, come and listen to the task force members talk for themselves in their own voices on the 20th of October um, at the five o'clock, whatever. We'll make sure you get the details, but uh, because that's exactly how we began, is asking what are the obstacles, and the Welcoming City Strategy then goes to systemically dismantle those obstacles. Another one that we came across when we were doing the Welcoming City engagement is if people experience racism or discrimination, there's nowhere official to go and report it. You can go to the police, which, you know, has a whole bunch of other challenges, but there's and so one of the really great recommendations that came up uh, that's, that's embedded in the the action plan 
is to have a welcoming hub. And someone actually suggested that the Tourist Information Center would be a good place because it's like right downtown, tourists can go there, but what if there was an also, also a place where, you know, if you're new to the city, you go to the ICA, of course, um, but it, it, and, and that, that welcoming hub would also be a place where you could go to report instances of racism or discrimination um, and, and, and kind of have some follow-up. So it doesn't always have to be kind of um, a, a law enforcement issue because sometimes that's a problem in itself. So yeah, great question. I could go on and on because we asked what are all the obstacles? We heard that there are a lot and then the welcoming city strategy is meant to, to start to dismantle those. Yeah, please. Yes, um, thank you both. I just wanted to um, paint a picture first um, of um, something that is informed by my own experience and um, maybe offer a pseudo uh, solution and see what you both think about this. So um, you both talked about resilience and reinventing ourselves and how important it is that we are working on ourselves, trying to be more resilient, observance and all that. And um, you also mentioned um, the conditions of the immigrants and refugees in this country and in Victoria, how um, most, if not all of them, are awesome people, the demographic that they're bringing, highly educated, resilient, have gone through so much. Um, I just wanted to um, say something like, um, I used to be a sessional instructor at the UV, and um, this was true uh, during a time that I uh, was um, visibly Muslim, I was wearing covering, head covering, and everything. And I cannot even count the number of times that I received anonymous uh, discriminatory um, slurs and foul language and emails by the students. And although the department was trying to be helpful and follow up, but there is really so much you can do and there's no way to find the people. So I have decided to completely um, not follow on that path, although it was always my dream to do that, so it's unfortunate. And um, I just want to remind uh, all of us that, yes, in immigrants and refugees are these res resilient people and have gone through so much, but I don't think you should expect um, that they have everything to deserve the same opportunities. Um, I, everyone else, everyone in this room has to just be themselves and not be superhuman to mm -hmm. deserve things. I would like to be normal and uh, be myself, make mistakes, but um, in my journey as an immigrant, I felt like I have to be at my best because I'm, I'm, I'm from the Middle East, um, a Muslim, so if I just get angry in a debate, I will be living this stereotypical angry Middle Eastern woman. Yeah. So that's it's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. to, to go through. And um, so, uh, for example, this year I know a lot of students are coming to campus, so I'm living at a room in my friend's house, so other incoming students can use my apartment because some of them I realize that are camping in Wall Street because they can't afford to find a place. Another reason for that is landlords want references for a person who's coming here for the first time. So the standards are so high for housing and for jobs. I'm again, I'm, I'm sorry I'm using a lot of examples about myself, but that's what I can talk about. Um, in going for jobs, I have, after finishing my PhD, I went for jobs that I, were, I was interested in and I thought I'm um, good at. And then going through all the process of several interviews and assignments and everything, it came down to, like, I, it was really close, and when I asked them why I didn't get it, because they checked the references and everything, they said it came down to um, making a decision between you and another candidate. So it's not satisfactory to see that there's no feedback, I don't know what's lacking, and it's hard with all the experience not to think that, okay, um, I don't say lower the standards, but just think about um, what someone with a new, complete new perspective can bring to the table, especially if the job is about equity and human rights. Um, so I feel like what I wanted to get at this pseudo uh, uh, solution was, is it possible to have a different set of um, standards or simplified so that it's just trauma informed, you know, like 
doing everything in a second language, doing it for the first time, all these forms that they have to apply to get to resources, um, awards that the students have to apply to, everything that I can't even begin to think about. Um, maybe have it simplified, have people who can sit with others and go through them, or just give people a chance without references, if they're new immigrants, if they're new refugees, if there's a homeless person who hasn't had a landlord in the last year. Some way that makes the process of getting the chance easier, and if they can prove themselves, they can just like, continue to be acceptable residents of the place if they're homeless. And if they've had um, alcoholism in their history, but they are trying at least, they can't just let it go immediately to get a house, but they can try and show a trend. Like, use those indications as um, ways to include them um, as, a, as a way of reinventing the system, not to the people, because I think they are doing as much as they can. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I went on a tangent. <laughs> Maybe I can just respond a little bit to, to what you're saying. First of all, I would never say that immigrants and refugees are perfect, nor should we ever expect them to be. I think quite often people feel that themselves, and uh, sometimes particularly in smaller uh, racial or racialized communities, people really feel the pressure of not doing anything to give you know, other family members or other members of the community a bad name. It's, it's one of the, the pressures that, you know, we hear about over and over and over again with immigrants. So, yeah, no, we don't expect people to be perfect. We know they're not. You know, it's, the immigrants are like any other group. There's a great variety, but I will say that the question of resilience, because people have to go through a lot. They learn how much they can, they can handle. And that's something that if you have never been pushed to have to handle something that's uncomfortable or you, you maybe don't develop that muscle the same way. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it, I think it's a reality for people. There's some really interesting approaches to hiring um, that I think have potential. And when I talk about a little bit of optimism and opening up, you know, we've been saying for people for years, stop harping on Canadian experience for new employees. Of course they don't have Canadian experience. That doesn't mean they don't have valuable experience that they bring to the job and knowledge and perspective and all of those things that are super important. But there, you know, a number of employers now I see are more willing to embrace, and this partly has to do with the fact that there, there's not as many people. When you know, they put out a job application, they're not getting 50 applicants coming in, they're getting one or two. And so they have to shift how they're doing things and, and you know, do a better job of supporting people to learn the particulars of the job that, you know, bring in their experience and apply it. So I think there's some hope there. I th I'm not going to lie and say that I think we're like, you know, almost there. We're not. I think we're really far back at the beginning. And of course, in terms of, you know, renting, we're constantly helping people find homes who have no local references. We know through the private sponsorship groups where refugees come in attached to a group of Canadians or local residents who have all their connections in the community, it's really good for the refugee because they get to take advantage of the connections that the people who are, you know, who are helping them and supporting them in the first year uh, give them. So they might not need a reference because Jordan's you know, brother has a place and it's you know, easy to, you know, there's that kind of connection is suddenly established. So we do try and find ways to replicate those kinds of systems or, or connections to try and build them up. Not easy, but yeah, we've got a long way to go. But thanks, those are really important comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two things that you said um, I think are, well, it was all really important, but the, this notion of trauma-informed I think is really, really important um, that employers, particularly maybe in certain sectors, but maybe everyone should be informed, uh, you know, have trauma-informed hiring practices. What, what, like that's, and that, again, like I love suggestions that are concrete, that can be done, we can train our employees, or, or rather our, our, at the city, our HR department, and so that's, that's great, I think, trauma-informed hiring practices. And then, I don't know this for sure, and I don't know all the details, but I, the province is actively hiring for equity, diversity, and inclusion. 
they're actively, they're just, they've kind of thrown the old rule book, whatever it was, out the window, and they're deliberately hiring people of color, indigenous people, immigrant, like, and, and I think that's awesome. Like, they're the province, so they can do whatever they want. Um, but I think that those kinds of things are, are really going to make a difference when you're not only for, for um, jobs uh, that, that require you know, an awareness of equity or inclusion, but all jobs. Like, I don't know, the senior manager of property management in the ministry of whatever. Like, they're, anyway, I, so I think that's a really positive sign, and I want to learn more about what the province is doing to see if we can implement something similar at the city. So yeah, thanks for raising those issues, and, and also thanks for sharing your experience. If I can follow, actually, on that, I'm just gonna, I see your question, we'll come to you in a sec. I just want to follow also on that, because part of the motivation for the talks was this housing component, and part of that last question revolved around housing also, and if, you know, if Fran had been able to join us, I think that would have been one of the focuses of her um, presentation. But the how, you know, when I think about the future, you know, a future just Victoria, it just seems that housing, um, as a relatively, I guess, uninformed president of Victoria, it feels like it's just heading in the wrong direction inexorably. You know, rents seem to be going up, um, property prices seem to be going up. I guess if you're, there's some benefit there for, um, uh, people collecting rents. I, suppose. I mean, there's some benefit, but there's a lot. There's many who don't. There, there are many. There's less obvious benefit than harm. It would seem in constantly rising housing prices. That you know, as long as we all are living in houses, we don't, you know, benefit in some ways. Um, so, is what are the? I guess for 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 Jean, I'd be curious to hear how large a role housing plays as an obstacle in refugee and immigrant settlement here, and what prospect of future improvement you see. And I guess from Lisa, you know, more generally, is there a role that the city can play? Do, are you optimistic? And and I get, you know, getting back to that question, of what are the barriers? How how much can the city transform if housing keeps heading? in the direction that it's currently going. Do you want to start? Sure. Um, so it, we, t we spend a lot of time on housing, and particularly for refugees, for government-assisted refugees who don't have this network of, of volunteers working with them. Um, in the last three months, we have housed one family and three individuals. And the others are still in temporary accommodations, which is not good. When people are in temporary accommodations, they, children can't start school, uh, you know, many services aren't available to them. They're just in a holding pattern. And it's extreme right now. We had a lot of people come in starting just about the end of June when travel restrictions were uh, loosened enough for people to be camp in, and, and they have to quarantine, so then they have to be sort of isolated for 14 days before we can actually start seriously working on things like housing but it's you know so for some people they've been there for three months that is way too long the standard that we have normally normally work on is two to three weeks so initially before this the um, the schools opened up for face-to-face -face classes students weren't here so it was actually fairly simple for us i mean relatively speaking and we have some landlords who we work with who are you know, very open when they have vacancies. But what we're seeing right now is the vacancies are going down. The temporary accommodation, there's competition for the temporary accommodation even because there's students who aren't in housing who are staying in, in hotels. Everybody wants a kitchenette. There's not very many kitchenettes in the city. Um, and there's people, you know, the people who are um, you know, they've got relatives in the hospital, so they're staying in a hotel while they're, you know, so we've got a lot of competition right now, and it's, I would say for our team of uh, five in the RAP program, I'd say they're probably about 90% of their time is going into housing right now. And we've been putting out calls everywhere, and it, it's just, there's nothing. So. Well, I'll pick up there. Um, no, that's okay. No, there is, Jean's right. There is nothing. I think this is this. And again, I know you've got your series organized for the the fall, but I think it's worth probably doing a city talk series or at least a panel specifically on housing, um, because I could talk for a long time about this, and, and there are others who could as well. And Fran would definitely have had a few things to say. The the problem with housing is that the whole city and cities across North America are exclusionarily zoned. They're zoned to keep 
people out of the majority of the city. So in, in Victoria, something like 55 or 60% of our tiny little land base is dedicated to single family homes. That is wrong and that is a problem. Um, and so right now we are undertaking quite a radical rethink of what the city is and who it's for and how land is organized um, through two programs. One is called Missing Middle Housing and the second is uh, Villages and Corridors. And so Missing Middle Housing, what we're proposing, and no, there hasn't been anyone freaking out yet, I think because they haven't really kind of caught on to what we're planning to do, um, but we're, we're, active, we're, we're looking to rezone the entire city to make it that any single family lot um, that's on, uh, you know, on a block um, can hold up to four or six units, and then any block end can be automatically uh, uh, available for townhouses. So right now, this is just, it's ridiculous. If you want to build a single family home, uh, you, you, you know, a new one, you can buy a, an old single family home, you can knock it down and you can put up a brand new big house. You don't even have to come to council, you don't have to talk to your neighbors, you don't have to do anything. If you want to build a duplex or a fourplex or a townhouse, sometimes it's like a two and a half year process just to build more housing. And it, we, we need to flip that on its head. And so that is what we're planning to do. Um, so if you're interested, if you Google missing middle housing, there's gonna be a survey. If you like the idea of what we're proposing, please say that this is a good idea because there's probably gonna be quite a bit of pushback. So that's one thing, to make the city's land base hold more housing. Secondly, villages and corridors. We've started with Fernwood, Hillside Quadra, and North Park. Um, in some ways because those are the lowest income neighborhoods in the city and we know that there's more housing needed uh, in those areas and what we heard is that we don't people don't want all the um, apartment buildings on busy roads they want apartment buildings in, in neighborhoods because it's nice to live in a neighborhood but don't just shove everything onto Bay Street and Quadra Street and so again we're looking to pre-zone a whole lot of land in those neighborhoods to make more room for more people so the, the zoning issue, it sounds so boring, but it's absolutely key. If we can set the table through these two programs for the future, then all of that housing can be built as of right without having to go through a political process. And the third thing we're doing, um, and again, I'm just really excited about this, is we're gonna make um, affordable housing as of right anywhere in the city. So if there's a nonprofit housing provider that wants to build affordable housing, if it fits with our official community plan, they don't have to have a rezoning, they don't even have to have a development permit. They just say, here's our building, here's what it looks like, and our staff say, check, that makes sense, and they can build the housing. So those three programs, if we can get them all passed in the next year, which I'm really hoping, um, there, there probably will be some significant public backlash, but we have to, this is where the reinvention is important. It's hard work, but it really does, uh, we need to set the table for the future. So that's a little tidbit on housing, but maybe uh, happy to talk more another time. Great, thanks Lisa. And I interrupted the question that was gonna come right here in the oh, front no, row. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, what, what does polite racism actually mean? Is that satire or is that just, because I always just assume racism is racism and it has a lot of impact regarding of how, if it's microaggression or some, like, something that is quite blatantly racist and direct. And the other question I had was with the welcome in, um, city project, is there the, one of the concerns I've always had and I've experienced, and as you can guess, I'm from the UK, and and I was a refugee, and here I'm like an immigrant as well, like I moved from the UK, and, and I still have like my um, cultural background with me, and one of the issues that I've always wanted to discuss is that, yeah, refugees and immigrants, it's like a minority, but it's also a minority within a minority, and that is the queer community. And I want to know, is there like some sort of support or projects or programs that is set to help like a lot of the refugees who are fleeing from countries like Syria or anywhere in the Middle East or anywhere in Africa where they are being prosecuted because of their gender and their sexuality and like what kind of supports can, can we give them? And, and like that is something that is important I always feel like that's something that is missed because you know when you come to a new country, the first thing you want to sort out is Accommodation, housing, financial support, education, and create, and sort of getting rid of the language barrier, learning English, and but after that, you know, resilience is important. How do we support people who are having these issues with their gender identity or their sexuality? Like, what is out there for them to get support? And if there is, is it done 
by people who are reflective of their journey, whether it's like, you know, a, a person of color, like, you know, I feel like a lot of refugees and immigrants feel comfortable talking about experiences that they've had when it's like someone that looks like them. And is that being set up as well? Is there a program to support people who can um, have, who can have a support, um, leadership role in like supporting these women or men or queer or is, is there something that has been set up to support them? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll go, go to your second comment yeah. before you first. Yeah, I, we increasingly in the refugee stream, mm -hmm. we are um, welcoming people from the transgen tra transgender LGBTQ mm -hmm. plus stream. And so we have also been building our programming to make sure that, you know, A, all our staff mm -hmm. are educated around that so that, you know, they, they start to understand what the issues and sensitivities might be. Mm -hmm. And then we have specific programs that are focused on that. We have some that are youth focused mm -hmm. um, and we have supports for adults mm -hmm. who are coming in um, and we have, we, we work with Rainbow Refugee, which is a group out of Vancouver that is specializes in, in uh, supporting refugees coming from those kinds of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so we've done a lot of work with them in order to build up our skills. So yes, there you know, is it everything we would want it to be yet? Probably not. But you know, it, it's it's definitely an area. One of our working committees in our, on our staff team is specifically focused on that to keep challenging ourselves to do better at that. So I think that's that's really key, and I see a lot of uh, good movement in that direction. Um, and in terms of who's delivering services, uh, I am a white woman in charge of an organization that is very diverse, possibly one of the more diverse, if not the most diverse, uh, staff makeup in in the community. So we have people from all different backgrounds. Many of our staff are immigrants or refugees themselves, or were in the past, and uh, speak a number of languages on staff. We have about uh, capability of about uh, 34 languages. And then we have resources available as well for other languages. So that, you know, a lot of the services we provide early on, in particular, are services around, are offered in first language or Many of the people we we uh, greet speak more than one language when they arrive here. So, yeah, we we um, we do have services, and they are, you know, we're doing our best to be culturally sensitive, language appropriate, and uh, supporting various uh, groups among those who those who come who who need special supports because of their particular situation. Polite racism. Um, I can remember when I brought home a friend of mine from a Chinese uh, ethnicity, grew up in Hong Kong with an English nanny. My mother said, oh, he speaks English very well. Yeah, he does. He speaks English better than I do. But, you know, so that, that's part of the kinds of comments. People have no idea. They think they're being, they're being nice and complimentary, but what they're doing is singling someone out. What they're doing is not recognizing anything about what their background is. We have a lot of, um, I would say, you know, people who are willing to talk about racialized people without actually saying anything super nasty, they're still calling them the other. They're still doing all this. So it's not. They're not the people that are out there, you know, painting swastikas. There are people like that on the synagogue. They're the, they're the people who think that they're being really open-minded, but actually they, they're not. They're still othering people. And so that's how I would describe polite racism. Many of them were very liberal people who, if you said, you know, you're being racist when you said they, they wouldn't understand why you were saying, you know, why you were saying that or why you were saying that. So that's kind of what I mean. And, Yes, you know, we talk now about microaggressions and those sorts of things, and that's kind of a new language to, a new framing of how those things happen, probably more appropriate than, you know, more, more reflective of reality than, than uh, the terminology that I'm using now. Please. Um, I had a question around the housing. Um, 
and I'm not sure it's really well formulated. So, um, I had lived in Vancouver area for many years and um, saw many, many high rises going up. And they were going up, and, and the rationale was often that we need more housing to make it more affordable. And the amount of time that I was in Vancouver area, it never became more affordable. It just became denser and more unlivable. And my children who grew up there, there's no way they can afford to, um, to live in that community. Um, it's not affordable for a middle class um, person looking to buy a, a home there. Um, so that plus, it gave the developers a large leeway to, to build more and more. And other cities like Hong Kong and Mumbai, which is, and Moscow, which is nothing but high rises, they're not affordable, they're not more affordable. So it seems like it's um, a bit of a big lie to, to say that affordability is linked to density. And um, because it doesn't seem to have happened in the places where, where the cities have become densified. So I'm wondering how you, how you rationalize those two things. Mm -hmm. That it seems that the more you build, the more people want to move in, the more services there are, the more competition there is for the land base. So it just keeps building on each other. And you were saying that, that the prices are going up now. Well, they'll continue to go up the more you build. So, so how do you reconcile affordability with um, uh, building more and knowing that that will make the land become more valuable. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and there are a number of ways to, to kind of to come at it. One of the reasons that we're um, rezoning the entire city to get rid of essentially get rid of single family zoning is because if we only did it in certain pockets or certain areas, that would increase the land value exactly as you're saying. And so if you take the whole city as one, approach and say, okay, everywhere fourplexes and sixplexes can go, or everywhere townhouses can go, then it, it, it keeps the land values down rather than um, making some areas of the city more valuable because you can more, build more housing on it. So that's, that's one approach. Um, in terms of high rises and density and affordability, um, and uh, Jean and I were talking about this beforehand, we are in a real crisis as a country. Um, I was on a panel um, organized by, by the OECD, and there were mayors from you know OECD countries and others uh, talking about the housing supply issue. And Canada is absolute at the bottom of the barrel of all 20 OECD countries in terms of housing supply right across the country. There's not enough housing for people who currently live here, and I'll give you the Victoria statistics in a moment. And then add on to the fact that 300,000 or 400,000 people per year are going to start coming again because we need to grow the country through immigration, we need to provide homes for refugees. There's, there's not enough housing in this country. And that's a problem because of affordability, but it's also a problem because of climate change. And so that's where density comes in. Density is not going to solve the affordability crisis for sure. But what it is going to do is to help us live in more compact communities so that we can walk to daycare, to the grocery store, to work. And so density isn't necessarily the answer to affordability, but it is in some ways one of our key climate mitigation strategies for keeping transportation emissions down. And now when it comes to Victoria and housing supply and affordability, um, there are two answers. One is the market's not gonna solve affordability. And I think that that's probably what you're getting at, which is why we need to build as much non-market affordable housing as possible. Uh, cool Aid, BC Housing, the Capital Regional Housing, Capital Regional Housing Corporation, I think is one of the best kept secrets in this region. It's, we now own, and I'm on the board of it, uh, 2,100 units um, that are, you know, some are 30% of market rates, some are rent geared to income. And so we need more, like that's the kind of housing we need to build that's affordable in perpetuity because it's owned by a non-profit or a housing corporation. 
and there's swaths of that being built. Like, you know, it's interesting. People will say, oh, look at all those new condos downtown. And, you know, one example is the, the building on Johnson Street. That's not new condos. That's our fire hall with 130 units of affordable housing on top. Brand spanking new building, beautiful new housing right downtown, uh, paid for by BC Housing and owned by Pacifica. So that's part of the answer is we need to have as much non market owned housing as possible, but the market does have a role to play. This, this uh, statistic will be shocking because it shocked me when our staff brought it forward. Right now in Victoria, just for people who are already living here, we're about 4,500 to 6,300 housing units short because 40 year olds are still living with roommates, people are still living with their parents, families of five are living in a bedroom or one or two bedroom unit where they need a three bedroom unit. So just to make up for the people who are already here, never mind all the people who want to come, or that like, you know, low estimate, 4,500, high estimate, 6,300 units short. So we do need to build more housing. It won't necessarily solve the affordability crisis, but it will at least get people out of two small units, uh, out of their parents' basements, and give you know, 35 year olds who want to move out of their uh, roommate situation uh, more space. So it's really, it's a great question that you've raised. There are no easy answers. and. Um, density itself isn't going to solve affordability, but building as much, you know, non-profit or state-owned housing, that's really going to help, I think. There's a question right behind that. This question as well. Yeah. It's mine, but I guess it's, it's very similar to what has already been discussed, and I was wondering about the time factor and the urgency of the number of people who don't have a roof or who live on the streets. and or who have been on BC housing lists for years and years, and we're not really resolving those, and those are crisis um, challenges. There's, there's you know, we need to help individuals in a timely way. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that, because when you're talking about the zoning challenges there, a year in the works, and there's gonna be so much pushback and all of that, what, what do you think, or what are your hopes for the short term and what we need to do and maybe if possible greater creativity in, in what can happen is in, in some ways. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the COVID has been great for creativity. Um, and one example is, you know, we've been talking about a tiny home village as a pilot project in Victoria forever, like for 10 years or something. And then in four months, we just built one and there are 30 people living there. Um, on the, the city-owned land right beside the Royal Athletic Park. So um, those th things can be done quickly. Um, the other way to get things done quickly, and I'm all for this, although not all members of my council are, and certainly some members of the public aren't, is the province can do whatever it wants. Like, they can just come in and build housing. They don't have to ask us, they don't have to ask anyone. And so the, the six, um, there are 280 units right now of supportive housing being built, four in Victoria, um, one in Saanich and one in central Saanich and the province just came in and said we're, we're just building these we're going to build them we're going to do the modular building so it's a six month build um, 280 units just like that no zoning no consultation no nothing and so I think that's one of the answers is the province just needs to assert its authority and tell us local governments that they're going to build this housing in our cities and that really creates almost immediate solutions so that's 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 one answer um, the province can just use its power more and we could just all thank them instead of pushing back. I think we're pretty much at time. I want to thank uh, both of our uh, speakers, Mary Helps and, uh, and Jean as well, for your presentations, for the uh, audience, for be being willing to come out. Uh, I have a few uh, formal uh, thank yous that I have to remember as well. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Lisbon Rose Redwood, who's the uh, geography professor who's been organizing these talks for the last few years. Uh, he's not able to be here due to COVID, but he's uh, helped to organize and brought the staff here and is really crucial to the series and will soon be back at the mic. Uh, we've had a lot of support for the, for the talks over the years from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, from the Faculties of Humanities and Social Sciences and Departments of History and Geography in particular. Uh, the Legacy Gallery is the amazing uh, home of these talks, and thanks to Nicole for helping out uh, today. And uh, no matter whether a huge crowd or small, it's always a beautiful space uh, to be in. I want to advertise our next talk as well. Um, 
on October 21st. Uh, uh, this talk will be historical in orientation, and so it's looking as a historian at UVic who's looked at pandemics and emergence from pandemics over many centuries of time. Uh, Mitchell Hammond, who's assistant professor uh, in the Department of History here, and his talk is entitled Epidemic Histories and Pandemic Futures. So we'll draw from the past to think about what can we learn from, from many past pandemics in Victoria today. That's October 21st uh, at 7.30 here. Doors open at 7. Um, and for me, I'm really grateful to the speakers. Again, uh, I guess I'm caught between apprehension that sort of motivated this, uh, um, this um, panel in particular. You know, are we headed towards um, you know, exacerbated problems as we come out of the pandemic? Uh, in Victoria. Um, and on the other hand, hopefulness, some of the hopefulness that I heard today from our mayor who speaks hopefully about the future and, and, and Jean as well about the impact that refugees and immigrants can have here. So uh, I think I'm probably still <laughs> that mix of kind of uh, hopefulness for what I think Victoria can be and apprehension about what the next uh, number of months might uh, show us to be, but uh, I'll, I'll be rooting certainly for, for a uh, more just city. Uh, as we emerge from the from the pandemic. Thank you again, and uh, good night.